And if you say yes, then I'll know I'm still online. Is that okay? Yes, it's all right. Okay, so every so often I'll just say, Aldo, can you hear me? But just to make sure that I, I'm still online. Excellent. All right, Gerardo. Hi, Aldo. Gerardo, I think it's time to begin. Yes, sure. Uh, welcome to welcome to, welcome to everybody. Uh, Gerardo, can you please put in context this plenary talk before I introduce Dr. Marlerno? So, good morning, Professor Des Marlerno. Nice to meet you uh, online. Yes. So shall I switch my shall I switch my camera on or not? Yes, you can you can switch your camera, please. Okay. Hello. So here we are in different locations. Uh, uh, we are here in the Department of Electrical Engineering uh, in Simbestap. And this plenary lecture, if you kindly accept to to give us, is. Uh, uh, is part of a triple line lectures and three days uh, conference, the 2021 18 International Conference on Electrical Engineering, Computing Science, and Automatic Control. This is the 18th edition of, of this conference. Uh, 26 uh, years ago, we started this conference first as a national conference, and, and now, uh, since, since uh, 2004, uh, the, this is an international conference and also sponsored by the IEEE. So it's a, a well-known conference here in Mexico City and 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 it is getting uh, more uh, international because this time we have uh, the participation from of of people from 28 uh, countries. So oh. this is an, a, a very nice. Uh, title of your conference because in the context of the COVID-19, this is the this is our second edition of uh, an online uh, online conference. So uh, uh, I think your title of your conference is very uh, uh, important, interesting, because we are still in uh, suffering uh, this situation of the COVID. Uh, so uh, and we are still learning because uh, the remote tools uh, are difficult, are different, are interesting in some sense. And well, uh, but uh, it, it, it enables also to, to connect and to get more participation with people from different countries like you. So it is a pleasure to, to have you here in, in this conference uh, and 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 also we know that you have several projects uh, working with uh, Professor Aldo, Dr. Giselle, uh, uh, Mauricio, uh, Lara, and you have yeah. a, a very strong collaboration with with people from our department. So many thanks uh, for your participation. So, so Aldo, are you there? Yes, Gerardo. So okay. I think we can I start. All right. Let me just introduce you. Uh, okay, Dr. McLernon, uh, as you can see in the screen, received his bachelor degree and his master degree from Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland. He then worked on radar systems in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland in, at Ferranti and later joined the Imperial College. Uh, then he did uh, the PhD in signal processing and wireless communications there. Uh, and uh, later on joined Leeds University in the United 
selected as a lecturer and then a professor. Uh, as you can see there, he, he has a, a lot of uh, papers published, 340 journal and conference papers. Uh, he has supervised over 50 PhD students. Uh, some of uh, some of the students are here in this talk. Uh, I am in. <laughs> <laughs> I am included among the among them. Yeah, some of them were lost, but now they appear to have uh, resurged. Yeah, uh, he has been um, organizing many conferences for several many conferences for several years. Some of those are listed there. Uh, there is something that it is not uh, this bio short bio doesn't say. He uh, um, likes to ride bikes. He's very good at that. He's also an accomplished piano player. He plays at bars and he has recently won a prize. Uh, the only thing is that uh, he's not very good at playing billiards, but you know, <laughs> nobody can be perfect, you know. Then uh, I, I, beat you yeah, I give him, <laughs> I, I give him a nice warm welcome. Please, the mic, the mic is yours. Thank you very much. Hola, buenos dias, como están? So let me share my screen. Let me just make sure this shares. I'll share the, uh, shall I share the window or the screen? Let me see. I'll share the screen. Okay, can you see that screen, Aldo? Yes, <laughs> yes, go ahead. But I've got something at the top here. It won't let me know. OK, OK, you can still see it. Yeah. OK, does yeah. that work? Let it me just works. check if that's working. OK, OK. And I've got to check when I put on this cursor, sometimes it doesn't it doesn't let me go forward. No, it's OK. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I've been to Mexico many times. It's a pity it's virtual. Um, as I say, this is something completely different. I. Uh, Currently, I'm working on uh, mesh networking, signal posting over graphs, sensor uh, systems, uh, but I, it's all a bit boring. And I thought, let's do something different. And because of lockdown, I ended up doing a little bit of work on this. So this is a tutorial, really. It's nothing to do with uh, any real research, but I hope that you enjoy it. So there are a lot of slides. Let's go very quickly. I'll send PDFs so that you can have the PDFs. So don't worry if you don't uh, pick up everything here. So exactly what I thought it was doing. It's, it's not letting me move forward. One second. So I go to this. Yeah, now it's doing it. So let me just. Whoops, sorry. Uh, I want to get this laser pointer. OK, so um, I'm from here and uh, I work here in Leeds. And as I said, these are my degrees, blah, blah. and. Uh, I want to try something very different for this talk and not talk about my, my own publications. So you're at a fashionable dinner party, Aldo, in Mexico City or Guadalajara, and someone says, what is the R0 value? What is the SIR model? Uh, what is the maths of COVID testing? Or uh, what is the K number? Uh, and you then say, I can explain after probably watching this, this tutorial, I hope. I hope these are the discussions you're having in Mexico. Can you still hear me, Aldo? Everything okay? Yes, everything is all right. Go ahead. Okay. The summary of the talk, I'm going to give a basic background in virus testing. I've got 60 minutes. I'm going to introduce this idea of the non-symmetrical binary channels used in communications to help understand the outcomes. Uh, look at receiver operator curves that we can also use as well, and look at how the test results might be improved. So this is all motivated by, from an engineering point of view, I noticed that some of the maths was similar to the, what we do in comms so I thought, can we can we apply this to uh, to COVID? That's what I'm trying to do here. And I'll talk a bit about conspiracy theorists that we have as well. And there are too many slides. So the PDFs will be supplied afterwards, and I'll jump through many of the slides. All you really need is Bayes' theorem, so nobody's going to struggle with this at all. Okay, so the background. Uh, what is the SARS-CoV-2 virus anyway? So this SARS-CoV-2 virus produces uh, COVID-19. And it's this, as you know, an RNA genome, a bit of uh, genetic material inside this protein shell. And these are the protein spikes. And you can get probably about a thousand of them into the size of a human hair. A mathematician in the UK showed that you could put the total volume of SARS-CoV-2 virus here 
into a fit in a can of Coke. Now, having been to Mexico many times, I know you like your Coke, but I should point out that other healthier drinks are available in Mexico. So <laughs> please do not drink this. Ericsson, you're probably drinking a lot of that in Gringo Land, but stop drinking it. It's bad for you. Okay. So at the beginning of COVID-19 infections, I, I downloaded some data and I started plotting it from the 31st. This is government data. And I noticed that it was uh, it was an exponential increase. Now, most people don't know what that is. That's the exponential increase where the independent variable is always raised to a par. And in this case, I noticed it was doubling about every three days. And this is just uh, when we had our lockdown. People started panicking here because with exponential increase, if you go from January to March, and now you go into April, look what happens in April. If there was no intervention, you would have 42 million people uh, infected. Now, that wouldn't happen because we, we'd hit herd immunity. But the point is that exponential increase is very serious. And this is what drove the government to take radical steps. And I'll show you later. They, they left it much, much too long for political reasons. So let's have a look at some basic background. What is the R0 number? So the R0 number is a dimensionless constant. It's the number of infections per unit time. So that's units of seconds to the minus one. And this is average infectious period, which is seconds, which gives you the number of people that you will infect, assuming 100% susceptible population. So nobody has uh, got immunity, nobody's been vaccinated. And that's a fundamental number that's been used not for COVID, but for lots of different uh, epidemics. However, if you look at the estimation of, of, of R0, this is a job in itself using lots of techniques, uh, Bayesian techniques, maximum likelihood, etc. And the errors that you get are huge. So the range in September 2020 went from 1.95 to 6.47 if you go through the literature, which is what I did. So it's not a very easy thing to predict. So if you look at this number in Wuhan, where it all started, at the very beginning, it was up near four. These are confidence intervals here. And then you had the Chinese New Year, where people were migrating all over China. Uh, and then they realized what was happening, and they had a, a lockdown. They locked down Wuhan, a city of uh, seven or eight million people, which was unheard of. And uh, they managed, of course, to get this right down to near one, and then underneath one, where it stopped spreading. So. The Chinese took very radical action, and the rest of the world, unfortunately, did not. So if we look at the R0 number and look at the number of people that get infected, take an R0 value of three, where everybody infects three people, and then the next three infect three, and so on. Then you just get a geometric series. And in this case, you would have 40 people infected after four generations. Now, if you go on to 10 generations, you get 30,000 people infected. So it's this exponential increase. That really is the thing that worries everybody. We also have what's called the effective reproduction number. So R0 is this basic reproduction number. The effective one, we multiply by X, which is the fraction of the population still susceptible. So if 100% are susceptible, this is 1, and R equals the effective number equals R0. If nobody is susceptible, that is, everybody is vaccinated, then R is equal to 0 in theory. Of course, we know that the vaccination wanes after six months, et cetera. So we're assuming that, uh, you know, we're not taking that into account. The vaccine efficacy, this measures the relative reduction in risk due to vaccines. So consider a vaccine efficacy of 90% below. So if you've got, say, 100,000 are not vaccinated, and let's say 100 catch, let's assume there's a 0.1% risk. Then if you vaccinate, you reduce that to 90% of what it was. So only 10 will catch COVID. You get a 90% reduction in risk. It does not mean that 10% of people catch COVID. What it means is it's a relative reduction in the original risk. So if the original risk was very small, then, you know, when you vaccinate someone, it'll be an even smaller risk. It's a relative reduction. That's very important. So 90% vaccine efficacy does not mean 10% of those vaccinated get COVID. It's a relative, a relative reduction in risk. What's herd immunity? Well, we've often said that, uh, let's assume that the vaccine efficacy is 100%. So then we need greater than 100 times 1 minus 1 over R0 immunity in the population. So how do we get that? Let's look at it. It's very simple. Let's take an example of five people with no vaccination. So here's five people. 
They're not vaccinated. One infected people will infect all of those five people on average, on average. Now, if we have five, uh, R0 is equal to, say, five, then put five in there and you get four over five, which gives you 80%. So it's saying you need 80% vaccination. So let's see why that works. So if you have 80% vaccination, you'll vaccinate four out of five. So here's the original five that are going to be infected. But of course, four of them are vaccinated. So in fact, you only infect one if you have 80% vaccination. And that gives you an effective R number of one, which means that as long as you've um, got vaccination bigger than four out of five, R will be below one and the virus will stop spreading. So that's a simple explanation why this equation gives you herd immunity. We also have, if we include vaccine efficacy, then that equation we put E at the bottom. Now, some of you can spot that if E, the vaccine efficacy, is small enough, this becomes bigger than 100%. And in that case, it's impossible to get immunity. So you need to have good vaccine efficacy or it's impossible to get immunity. So I took an example. Uh, this was in the very early days. Uh, it may have increased since then, but if you had an efficacy of 81% and uh, an R0 of 3, then you would need 82.3% uh, uh, immunity in the population in order to get this herd immunity. Aldo, is everything okay? Can you still hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. So let's look at where R0 comes into what's called the nonlinear dynamic SIR model. Some of you may have heard of this model. So it's three nonlinear equations. And we're measuring here, not numbers, but the fraction. So these are four, three fractions that add up to one. And S is the fraction of the population that are susceptible. So these have not got immunity from having had COVID, and they haven't been vaccinated. This is the fraction that's now infectious. And that infectious period might last for 10 days. And this is the fraction that's been removed. And they've either died, or they've recovered, or they've got immunity. And these, this is a very famous uh, model, and it's quite a simplified model at the moment. And it shows you how this group, the infectious peer, people, increase. So what will happen is that those susceptible will always decrease. They could decrease to zero, or they may plateau off when you get herd immunity. The recovered or those people who are dead will increase, and those infected will rise up to a peak and then go down again. And the point is that we want to reduce that peak so we don't overwhelm the uh, health service. So let's have a look. Where does R0 come into that? Well, beta is the infectious rate, which is here. Gamma equals 1 over tau, where tau is the infectious period, which is here. And R0 is equal to beta over gamma, because beta over gamma gives you beta tau. And if you remember, we defined R0 as beta, that is the uh, infectious rate, times the infectious period. So that's what R0 is. So let's see how this model actually works. So one way of looking at the model is to look at water flowing from one container into another container, and then into a third container. Now, there's some feedback between these containers, and let's have a look at that. So let's take the first equation, those susceptible. So we have this equation here, and if we look at that, what we're saying is that the rate of coming out of this bucket is proportional to the water in it. And that's a good analogy, because the more water you have, the faster it comes out. So if you reduce the water, it comes out slower, which is really what's happening in this equation. Now let's look at the effect of I of T. So we get some feedback from this, which isn't what normally happens in water flowing. So what we have to do there is we have to feedback and say that when I is large, we have a large hole here. When the number of infected gets smaller, we start closing off that hole. And that makes sense because, you know, if you have um, the more infected people you have, uh, the more you're going to infect others and the susceptible will become infected. The less infected people you have, uh, the less uh, you're going to infect, and so the susceptible will change very slowly. So all, all this is based on what actually happens in practice. And eventually, 
when the infected goes to zero, then you close off the rate of change of susceptible totally. And that's what's happening here. And again, putting in different values, you can model what's actually happening here. And the whole idea is that you want to keep R0 small enough so that you don't overwhelm the healthcare capacity of your system. And that's called flattening the curve by reducing R0. You can solve that continuous time uh, uh, coupled linear difference equations uh, by simply using Euler's method, which you're all familiar with. It's just discretizing uh, that system. So let's point out that you should realize whenever you're modeling, whether it's wireless communications or, or anything, every SAR model is wrong. But of course, Box, who's the famous statistician, said all models are wrong, but some wrong models are useful. And what he meant was this. So here's the SARS predicted, and here's the actual SARS. And you can see that this is wrong, but it's very useful because it gives you a good approximation to what actually happened. Here's some early COVID data from China. You can see why the Chinese were so worried, because compared to SARS, this was going off the scale. And that's why they locked down Wuhan so early. So there's different ways. I mean, it's it's a parameter estimation problem, but a very simple way, which is not a rigorous way of doing it, is to just fit the model to the data, which you can often do. So we take the model and we, we adjust beta and we adjust gamma and we adjust, uh, sorry, beta and gamma in order to, there's the data, and we want to fit the model S, I, and R to that. So if you fit the model to that, you can get an estimate for R0. That's one way to estimate the reproduction number. Of course, all of this is in the past. You will be one week out of date with this data. So it's uh, it's looking back with hindsight. And this is what they did uh, in this paper down here in Iran. Found they had uh, 4.86 in the first week of the pandemic. If you remember, Iran had a massive explosion, I think, in the early days. It had a very high R0 number. OK, so what's the problem with testing? Aldo, you can still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. So you come along to your doctor, you display symptoms, you have a test, a lateral flow test, a PCR test, whatever it is, and you get a positive result. I put normally positive is upwards, but I put it negative because that means you've got COVID. I put the thumb up if you get a negative result. And the question is how certain can you be that you have the virus if you get a positive result? And how certain can you be that you're virus free if you get a negative result? And what, what motivated me to do this uh, investigation was that the press got so mixed up with the statistics, it really annoyed me. But it's very easy to lie with statistics. So I can give you, I'm going to give you a correct statistics, but I'm going to mislead you with the statistic. I've just got a new test for COVID-19. I devised it myself. It only took me five seconds. And it costs virtually nothing to implement, and it gives immediate result. And I'm happy to sell this to Simvastav if you want to pay me a million pounds, please. I then tested it on the whole population of the UK, and it was an accurate, correct result nearly 99.75% of the time. This is true. I'm not lying, but I'm misleading. Am I telling the truth? And the answer is, I am telling the truth, but my test is useless. No matter whether you're healthy or whether you're ill, my test always says you're negative, you're negative, you're negative. And in the 1st of April 2021, there was a, a prevalence of disease of about 0.25%. So my test will be correct 99.75% of the time when tested on the general population. So the accuracy of my test tested over the population is meaningless. You need some other criterion. And this is the problem with COVID. So many of the statistics are misinterpreted by the press and by other journalists. OK, so let's start looking at some of these important parameters that uh, the limitation of R0 is that it, it's, a, it's an average reproduction number. It assigns the same reproduction number to everyone, to all. And what we really want is an individual reproduction number for each person. But that individual reproduction number will be a random variable. So we want to assign to each person a random variable which represents their reproduction number. And the way we do that is uh, if we, traditionally, 
we say R0 is the average reproduction number. Now, the secondary infections, Z, and again, this is from epidemiology, I didn't prove this, is generally a Poisson distribution, but it's got an average of R0. So the expected value is R0, but it's Poisson distributed. So there's the Poisson distribution for different values of R0. There's only one parameter. And as you increase R0, you make this broader at the same time. So both the mean and the variance get affected by R0. Now, the population estimates of R0 can obscure con considerable individual variations. And this happened with SARS and super spreading events. So if we introduce this random variable V, and you can show that we can, we're going to choose it such that the expected value of Z will be R0 and the expected value of V will be R0. So the expected value of Vs are not, and the expected value of Z will be R0. Traditionally, V is a constant, which is that. But to get this K number, we're going to use it as a random variable. So this leads to the K parameter. And it's called the dispersion parameter. It's an, I mean, I've never heard this word before, really. It's, maybe it's only used in epidemiology. So it determines the variation of the individual reproduction numbers. And it provides a more nuanced view of how the disease is spreading rather than if it's spreading. So if I say R0 is 4, you know it's spreading very fast. But in order to control it, you need to know how it's spreading. And this is what the K number does. So if you look here, this guy's got a, an R number of 2. This is, this is a snapshot. So if you can imagine, this is a snapshot of a series of random variables, one realization. You take another realization, it will be different. Uh, now, if you have a large K, then you have low dispersion or high homogeneity of the individual reproduction numbers. And what I mean by that is, here the reproduction numbers go from 0 to 7. So they have a reasonable range, but it's not that big. So a large K gives you low dispersion, that's low dispersion, or high homogeneity. They're, they're pretty much all the same between 0 and 7. Now, if we have a small k, then what we get is a large range of numbers from 0 to 16. So small k gives you high dispersion or high heterogeneity. So you can see here, this guy's got 16, this guy's got 11. So these are super spreaders. This is telling you how it's transmitting, not if it's transmitting. We know that from the average R number, but how? And the other important thing to notice is because you've got high heterogeneity, you have some what are called dead enders that are zero. And this is very useful because as you make K small, too small, you get very big super spreaders, but you get dead enders, which means that the pathogen cannot spread anymore and it can die out. So that's why K is very important. So that's what I've just said there about the uh, dead enders. So Low K value, a uh, small number of infected people are responsible for large amounts of disease transmission, like this guy and this guy. So if you take the 1918 influenza, you would K around one, maybe 40% of infected people will not pass on the virus. But if you make uh, K much low, lower, down to 0 0.1, then this proportion rises to 70% not passing on the virus, because you get lots of these, these zeros. You can think of this as a measure of the variance of these individual numbers. So this is saying that the pathogen can only spread via one of the dwindling super spreading events. So if you make K low enough, then the uh, spread will extinct, extinguish itself. OK, so let's now have a look at what are the candidates for this particular random variable V here. Remind yourself again, V is the random variable. Its average value is R0. The expected value of Z, which is uh, what it produces. Uh, Z is a Poisson function of, of V, where V is the parameter for the Poisson function. So we could have V equals R0, which means it would be a constant. That's the way we normally do it. Or you could have it, and again, this is from epidemiology, you could have V exponentially distributed. And that would give uh, Z, if you take Z as a Poisson of an exponentially distributed random variable, you get a geometric random variable. You don't have to prove that. You can just do it in MATLAB and see for yourself. Or you could say V is gamma distributed. Why have we chosen these? 
because, again, epidemiologists say this is what is most likely in practice. And if V is gamma distributed, then you end up getting a Poisson of gamma gives you a negative binomial. And this is the one that seems to be the most popular one with epidemiologists. So uh, I'll put this in the PDFs. I had to define the gamma function, which is a continuous random variable. And I've defined it because there's lots of different definitions. And the dispersion parameter is 1 over k, where k is this shape parameter in the gamma function. So that's where the k1 comes from. The problem is when you re read epidemiology papers, they use different nomenclature completely from what we do. Um, so when you look at the k1 parameter, it affects uh, the variance like that. So as you increase k1, the variance gets smaller. You can see what's happening here. As you make k1 lower, you get a bigger variance, a wider spread. There's also the Poisson parameter. You should all know what a Poisson random variable is. It's a discrete random variable. And the negative binomial, again, there's many definitions. I had to look around for this to make sure I got the right one. Sometimes in epidemiology, they use different variation, different definitions that, that we use. So that's how it changes as you change R, this parameter here. Okay, that's the number of, that's just NC, uh, K plus R minus one CK is the number of combinations of K that you can take from this. Okay, so here we are. We're gonna choose this as a gamma function. And we're gonna take Z is gonna be a Poisson distribution of this gamma function. And that's how we're going to get the secondary infections. And that's going to give us the spread so that's a summary of what we've already agreed. OK, so if we have, again, just to make it clear, large K1 under dispersed, we get values that are all pretty close together. Small K1 over dispersed, we get a few super spreaders and a lot of dead enders. Let's put it to work. So what I'm plotting here is the proportion of infectious cases ranked. So that that's the most. 20% most infectious. That's the 40% most infectious. And that's the expected proportion of a transmission that you get from the 20% most infectious. So if you have a homogeneous population, the 20% most infectious will give you 20% spread. The 40% most infectious will give you 40% spread. But what we've got here is decreasing K1. So this is the dispersion coefficient. So remember what happens for very small values of K1, we have a lot of super spreaders. So that means that 20% here give you nearly 90% of infection because of the super spreaders for small values of K1. And down here for monkeypox, 20% give you 60% of the spread and so on. So this K1 tells you how it's spreading, not if it's spreading. Now, what you can do here now is you can take this dispersion parameter k. So we check, we are increasing the dispersion parameter going this way. And we're looking at the most uh, infectious 20% of cases. So if you start here uh, with this value for k1, then you can see that SARS is up here. And as you slowly increase k1, you get a proportion of transmission from the most uh, infectious 20% goes down. So increasing, 20, uh, increasing K1 reduces due to a higher proportion of non-transmitting cases. Okay. Right. So let's look at extinction outbreak. How does this work? So what I'm plotting here is, here's the basic reproduction number. We're increasing R0. And here's the probability of extinction of the outbreak. And here's the uh, gamma probability distribution function, and I'm choosing it for different values of K1. K1 equals infinity. So look what happens here. Clearly, if your R0, irrespective of what the K1 is, if your R0 goes below 1, which is what's happening here, then the probability of extinction is 1. Because if R0 is below 1, you don't get any, the transmission will eventually die out. That means that uh, one, if the R0 is 0 0.5, it'll take two people to infect one person. But if R0 increases, then uh, the probability of extinction 
uh, goes down. Now look what happens here. So if I start here and I have a K1 of one, as you increase R0, the probability of extinction goes down. However, if I have an R0 fixed of three, and I look at what happens to the K1 value, so if I reduce K1, even though my R0 is three, if I reduce K1, I'm going to have uh, super spreaders and dead enders. And those dead enders eventually, if I make K1 small enough, will eventually lead to a probability of one that the disease will become extinct. Although I'm rushing through it a bit, but could you hear me? Yes, it's all right. Okay. Go ahead. Now let's look at COVID testing and this idea of the non-symmetric binary comms channel. So I'm going to devise a system for testing for COVID. So you're either infected, is the person crying, or you're not infected, smiling. And you either get positive or negative coming out. So one person is either infected or not infected, takes the test, and the output is either positive or negative. Um, neither are 100% accurate because of false positives and false negatives. So that's the system, and we can model that whole system like this. Along this axis, we have what's called the sensitivity. Now, that means the probability that you test positive, given that you're infected. That's the sensitivity of the PCR test. Along here, we have the probability that you test negative, given that you're not infected, and that's the specificity. This is the probability that you test positive. This is the probability that you test negative. And this is the priors. This is the probability that you're infected when you turn up, is the probability that you're not infected. So you can see, we have the binary symmetrical communication channel. This is the binary non-symmetrical communication channel. And so this is first year undergraduate stuff. You can easily understand that. You only need three parameters. You need that one, that one, and that one, because that and that equal one, and that and that equal one, and that and that equal one. Now you can also, from that, you can get the a posteriori, and these are the most important ones. You're not so much interested, what's the probability that you test positive if you're infected? What you're interested in is what's the probability that you're infected if you test positive? And the media always mix this one up with this one. So you can have a very high sensitivity, but this can be low because the priors are unequal. We know that from communication channels. There's the probabilistic binary channel. I'm going to go through this quick because I'll give you the PDFs. They use different wording in uh, epidemiology and biology. So the prior probability is the probability that you're infected, probability you're not infected. Okay, and that's called the population prevalence. In the communication channel, it was the probability that you transmit a zero, trans probability you transmit a one. The sensitivity is also known as the true positive rate, or it's the probability PI. I've colored it in blue up here. It's the probability that you'll test positive given that you're infected. And the specificity here is the probability that you'll test negative given that you're not infected. Now going up that way, this is the probability of a false positive rate. It's the probability that you'll test positive given that you're not infected. So you're not infected, but you test positive. So that's a false positive rate. And this is the false negative rate. The probability that you'll test negative, given that you're infected. And ideally, we'd like both of those to be close to zero. Now, these are not on the figure. These are the uh, these are the um, these are four posteriori probabilities. So we talk about the positive pre precision PPI PPV value, which is the probability that you're infected if you test positive. The probability that you're not infected that you test negative. The probability that you're not infected that you test positive and the probability that you're infected that you test negative. So don't worry, I'll put this in the PDF, but you have to be careful and define these exactly correct. This is called the false discovery rate and the false emission rate. I prefer just to work with these probabilities. It's much easier to understand. These are the posteriori probabilities which come from this, okay? And then you can, if you want an example of how to divide, how do we work that out? What's the probability you're infected given that you're, you test positive? Well, we simply use Bayes' law. So that's the probability that you test positive if you're infected, that's the sensitivity. We put that in there. That's the prevalence, we put that in there. And that's the probability 
uh, that you test positive, and you can get that from the law of total probability. And so you can work those equations out like that. So what can we do to improve the test? Uh, we can adjust these two, the sensitivity and the specificity. Now, these are not controllable because the prevalence is fixed. However, however, let's notice two things. If it looks like we've got two independent parameters, but there's really only one independent parameter. If I just change the threshold, then one of these will go up when the other one will go down. However, if, if you don't change the threshold, and you can, you can change them independently, but just to remember that if you're using a threshold setting, then these are not independent. One goes up while the other goes down. And the other thing is that this is not strictly true because we can get, uh, we can look at your symptoms and we can say that's different than the population prevalence. So if the population prevalence was one and two, but you came in looking very, very ill, we may say you have an 80% chance. So you can do that. So let's take some quick examples. Let's assume that the sensitivity is 0.98. And a man walks into a doctor's surgery without any symptoms. And the doctor said, if you are infected with the virus, then the test will give a positive result 98% of the time, which is absolutely true. That's the sensitivity. So the man tests positive, and the doctor said, I'm very sorry, but I'm 98% certain that you have the virus. Why? Because she confused that with this. So she, sorry, she confused probability that you're infected, given that you're positive, with the sensitivity. So what is the probability that you're infected, given that you test positive? So I, I went through the maths when I did this in 2020, and it turns out that that becomes 9.35%. So it's not 98%, it's only 9.35%. And the reason is because you have unequal priors at the start here. So another way of looking at it is take a million people. Uh, the probability of infection is that, so 2,100 will be infected. The probability of not being infected is that, so that many people on average will not be infected. So the sensitivity is 0.98. If you're infected, then you'll test positive but you'll also get false negatives. So you'll get 42 who'll test negative. Here, you'll get, if you're negative, if you're not infected, then not many will test negative, but you'll get some false positives. So there's the total number test positive, there's the total number test negative. The probability that you're infected, if you test positive, is the sum of those two on the denominator, and on the, on the numerator, it's that. So that gives you the 9.35%. And the reason that we confused that with 9.35 was because of these priors being very, very different. Okay, so if you test uh, positive, there's only 9.35% chance you've got it. If you test negative, you're virtually certain that you haven't got it. So what the doctor should have said, before the test, you had a 0.21 chance of having the virus. That's the prevalence. After the positive test, that's increased to just 9.35% because of the unequal priors. Although, if you had any COVID symptoms, then that would change. So apparently a lot of medical students make this mistake. Let's take another example. Let's take two people, John, who's really healthy, James, who's not healthy, and they both taste negative. What's the probabilities of false negatives? So again, I looked at the COVID prevalence when I did this in May 2020. And if I do that for James or for John, who's who's healthy, so we're going to if he's healthy, then we're going to stick with this prevalence here. And if you go through that, you find a two percent chance of a false negative. So he tests negative, but there's only a two percent chance that he does not have the virus. So I have only a two percent chance that uh, he has the virus. Now James presents with COVID systems symptoms, so we can't use this probability that he's infected. And what the doctor has to do is make an estimate. James has got uh, uh, loss of smell, uh, got a fever, and uh, loss of taste. So they might say the probability that you've got COVID is 0.8. So if you put that in, and if you come out negative, then the probability of a false negative is 
So genes, you know, may very well have the disease. We can also uh, use this model in order to estimate uh, the, the prevalence. Let's assume the real prevalence is 1%. Okay, and we take 1,000 people. So the real prevalence is 1%. We take 1,000 people. And from that, we try to estimate from that 1,000 people how many tests positive over the number tested. And we find that we get 5.65%. Now, that's incorrect compared to a prevalence of 1%. So you couldn't use this model in order to estimate the prevalence. You really need to use some more advanced mathematical technique. I remember that throughout words matter in maths and statistics. So all these three following statements refer to false negative test results, and all three have different probabilities. So there you are, there's the model. I go for a virus test. What is the probability that I will both test negative and also have the virus? So the probability that you'll test negative and also have the virus will be in that direction. It's the probability that you're infected down here. So that gives you that probability. And that's a false negative. I go for a virus test. What is the probability, given that I already have the virus, that I will test negative? So given that you already have the virus is here. So it's in this direction. I'll test negative. So it's here. So it's simply that value there. And finally, I go for a virus test. What is the probability, if I test negative, that I really do have the virus? And that's the posteriori probability. So there's four examples of false, ne three examples of false negatives with three different uh, probabilities. And you have to be very careful in how you use words in maths and statistics. So I've put this in the PDFs. I've summed all these together, put all the equations in, and you can have those PDFs at the end. So what can we do? We can alter the sensitivity and specificity to improve the uh, performance. So if we start with the accuracy of the, uh, there we go. So the accuracy can be written like this. What's the accuracy? It's going in this direction. It's that times that, because that's accurate. And it's one minus uh, PI, which is that one. Sorry, times that, that's correct. So that's the sensitivity times the specificity. And if you prove, if you have specificity on this axis, sensitivity here, and parameterize it on the prevalence, then this starts tilting down towards zero. So there's with a prevalence of 0.9, there's with a prevalence of 0 0.6, 0 0.4, and 0.1. So you can easily map the accuracy for any sensitivity and specificity. If you, what we're interested in is, the probability, if, if we know what the uh, infectious rate is, we're interested in the posteriori probability of infection. That is, what's the probability you're infected given that you test positive? And what's the probability you're infected given that you test negative? And um, we have the prior probability of infection along this axis. So here's an example where we have 98% sensitivity and specificity. And I'll put that in the notes, how I, how I plotted that. So here you are as an example with 0.9 and 0.9. Now, let's assume we wanted to reduce the dangerous false negatives. So what's a false negative here? So I've got the probability that I'm infected given that I test negative. This is the false negative. And you can see as the prevalence increases, the false negative rate increases. Now, if I want to reduce that, I can reduce that by increasing the sensitivity to 0.99. So let's do that. There's the sensitivity at 0.9. Let's increase the sensitivity to 0.99. And look what happens, it dips right down. And this gives a small increase, which is okay. So what if I make the sense, uh, I, I increase the uh, sensitivity to one. So if I increase the sensitivity to one, here's 0.9 and 0.9, then it hugs the bottom like this. And of course, this is ID. What we really want is this orange to go like that and the blue to go like that in order to get a good test. So you can see what happens uh, with an animation 
as we change the sensitivity. They get closer and closer to the no test as you change the sensitivity, which means that the uh, for poor sensitivity, these tests can be very poor. And we also have to take into account the probability of uh, prior infection. So what are the requirements for a good test? Well, we want P of I, the probability that you're infected, given that you test positive, we want this to be much bigger than no test. And we want this to be much smaller than no test. So there's a very good test performance. That would work very well. And there's a very bad test performance closer to the uh, diagonal along the center. OK. So any of you who've worked in sensor analysis or radar or anything, you've heard of receiving operating curve for a test. So I gave this example of diabetes of uh, false positive, false negatives. Well, I've got a threshold here. What happens if I take the threshold and I'm trying to detect uh, blood glucose sugar level and I move the threshold up to here? What happens is that if I do that, then the, the positive, the true positives and the false positives will increase and the true negatives and the false negatives will decrease. Sorry, the true positives will decrease and the false positives will decrease and the true negatives and the false negatives will increase. So if you now test positive, you're 100% certain that you have diabetes compared to 80% before. But if you test negative, uh, you're only 55-7% certain. What I'm trying to show here is if you change the threshold, you get some good results and you get some bad results. So one way to change things is to change the test, the threshold. Another way is to improve independently the sensitivity and the specificity. So if you're doing hypothesis testing, then you might remember this, the Newman-Pearson theorem, which I've used in many uh, papers. And I was trying to apply this to COVID, but I tell you what, I gave up. It was too complicated because uh, you have hypothesis here, and you've got to get the PDFs, and I just could not find these PDFs. So this is what we would traditionally would do, uh, but I couldn't manage to do it. So there's a paper for someone to write there if they want to use Newman Pearson in uh, hypothesis testing for COVID. So let's take an example here. Again, stick with blood glucose. You could do the same for COVID, but I haven't got the PDFs. So um, if you take the case where this is where someone, we're trying to look for someone who's got diabetes. So y equals zero is someone who does not have diabetes. Y equals one is someone who has diabetes. And this is the blood glucose level. So if you've got diabetes, on average, you tend to have a, a probability of a higher blood glucose level. If you don't have diabetes, you tend to have a lower. So where should we set the threshold? If these are symmetrical, you would know you'd set the threshold in the middle but sometimes these are not symmetrical. So what do we do? So just to remind yourself, this area here is the true negative rate. This is the false negative rate. This is the true positive rate, and this is the false positive rate. These areas, these integrations, if we put those in there. So what this is saying is, this is saying, if you're above this, then you definitely have got diabetes. But this is the group of people who have not got diabetes, and so they may trigger alarm, and that would give you the false positive rate. Okay, Aldo, can you still hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So what's the optimum threshold? Where do we choose the optimum threshold? So we would do the same with COVID. So what you can do is you can color code these thresholds. So color code all the possible thresholds and look at the true positive rate and the false positive rate. So there's the false positive rate along the bottom here, and there's the true positive rate. The true positive rate is nothing more than the sensitivity. And the false positive rate is one minus the specificity. Okay, now what we'll do is we look, these dots here are to do with the false positive rate and the true positive rate for the different thresholds. So if we have our threshold at A, what does that mean? If you put your threshold down here, then anybody who's got COVID, sorry, I've got high glucose level will be detected as being diabetic. But all these people here who are not diabetic will also be detected. So you get a false positive rate of one and a true positive rate of one as well. If you put it B in the middle, you get somewhere here. And if you put it at C, 
up here, then you get zero false positive rate and zero true negative rate. That would be the optimum case where you have a distribution with a very small variance for those who've got diabetes and uh, a distribution of glucose or a very small variance for those who don't have it. Now look what happens here. That's A, the threshold. If I put a threshold A there, that's a threshold B, and that's a threshold C, and that's a threshold D. Now what happens is that most, if I was to put in all these lines, they would all hug the top left-hand corner. And we know that a good classifier points hug the top left hand of the uh, receiver operating curve. So we want for COVID something that does that. Now to do that, you have to go into the actual more in detail about lateral flow and PCR tests. And I have not had the time to do that. So what we can do here is, of course, we have the receiver operating curve, and we all know that a measure of how good the receiver operating curve is, is the area under the curve. So what we're looking at here is the area under the curve as I change the threshold. So as I move the threshold, I end up getting this. And the area under the curve is we're looking at the area under that square. So that would be 100% if it was sitting up here. The area under that curve now is imagine you draw a line down here. It's that area there. And that area is 0.853. It would be one if it was totally up here. And so the different distributions, as you change the different distributions, as they become non-symmetrical, then you get different areas. I mean, if they're completely separated, the area under the curve gives you one because you can have a threshold right in the middle. So we can do the same for COVID. We can apply what we know already in uh, hypothesis testing, receiver operating curves, and try it for COVID. So there's the uh, the type of good classifier. That's the best classifier there. It's not very good, and that's probably the middle one. And that's a better one. That's a good one. It's not quite good, but uh, you really want it to be going up like that. Okay. The receiver operating curve is also used, of course, when your credit card. Uh, now, where do you put it? Uh, they generally put it, they put this receiver operating curve to maximize the true positive rate. So what they'll do is they'll maximize this true positive rate, move it right down here, which means that some innocent people will get caught. But the understanding is better that the innocent suffer than the guilty go undetected. So when I was using my card for just $2 the other day, it wouldn't let me pay it because... I don't know, maybe it, it thought I never use it for something as small as that. Uh, it was a problem, but it was good that the true positive rate was very high. So improving test results. Uh, let's go back to that, sorry. We can improve the test results by improving the sensitivity, the specificity, or by just changing the threshold, which will change each one of these independently. Uh, in the PCR test, we can see that, um, for example, we know that things like we get these false negatives with before the symptoms actually appear. So this is the this is the sensitivity, which is that value there, but it feeds into the posteriori, which is the 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 uh, the a posteriori, the probability that you test uh, that you're given that you test negative that you're still infected. So these are the false negatives. And you get pretty high. You get 11% probability of a false negative before you start becoming infected. So you really want to try and stop that by altering the test. And we can look at how that's parameterized on the uh, actual pretest probability. That's the prevalence here that we're looking at. So that's why we need to improve the test. Now, you can do it by all these different... I'm not going to go into this because this is more to do with how you actually take the swab and how you how you try how you take it back home. Uh, you can look at how you improve the PCR process. And colleagues who are working in nano uh, technology and bioelectronics are working in this area in in my department. You can look at how you improve the estimation of the prior probability. I noticed that some people uh, were doing this by trying to improve P of I. So they they would try to fuse data from many sources. You could take the PCR result. 
You could say where you actually have come from, look at your travel history, look at your social context, a digital COVID app, your health data, you could use imaging, and even people are trying to use stochastic geometry. The problem is that everybody took their own discipline and tried to throw it at COVID to see if they could improve the uh, testing result. And for 90%, it was a waste of time. But we have to do something with our research that's useful. So I suppose this is what was happening. I, I started looking at this. What happens if you take the test n times in a row? So this was a headline in 2020 that a nurse had three negative swabs before she was finally found to have the disease after a CT scan. So imagine, James, there's a sensitivity of 0.7 and a specificity of 0.95. And James presents with a fever and loss of test. How many negative test results must he obtain in to reduce the false probability to below 4%? So again, remember that. That would be if he presents, let's assume because he's got symptoms, let's assume the prevalence is 0.8 or his probability of infection is 0.8. Then the probability of a false negative is 59%. So how can we improve that? So let's look at the probability that he's infected, and we'll use this nomenclature here, which means n brackets n means probability that you're infected, given you've taken n tests and tested negative n times in a row. So that's n tests, and you test negative n times in a row. So if you go through the maths and that, you can simply write it like this. And what we do is we change the value of n. So if we change the value of n, if that's uh, with one test, uh, two tests, two negatives in a row, three negatives in a row, and four negatives in a row, it goes below at uh, 4%. So that's the probability that you're infected, given that you had n negatives in a row. So after having worked that one out, and I never saw this anywhere before, I then said, well, what happens if we have a mixture of positive and negative results? So let's assume we have n tests with n1 negative and n2 positive. So if I do that, I end up getting this result. And then what I can plot, this is the number of positive tests, this is the number of negative tests. And I can simply do this. This is the probability of a false negative. Now, this is the probability that you're infected, given that you've tested uh, n1 negative tests and n2 positive tests. So if I've got two positive tests and four negative tests, the probability that I'm infected is this. Okay, you can play around with this yourself. There's lots of different things that you can do. Take the test n times in a row. So the probability of this as being a false positive is 11.4%. There were lots of more fanciful ideas that came out of the literature. Uh, for example, Aldo, can I continue on? I'm a bit over time here. Well, um, they are telling me now that uh, we have a little bit more time, but I don't know, Gerardo, how are we going on time? We started, he... we started at 5.40, I think. Still have, we still have time, Aldo. Okay, okay. Let, let, let's go ahead. 10 minutes. So people started looking at this. When you have COVID, you breathe differently. Can you work out automatically the way someone is breathing differently? Uh, now, the idea was to use Wi-Fi and to use the micro Doppler coming back from this to work out uh, if this, your breathing was affected. And this came from, originally MIT used this to measure the beating of the human heart. They produced a paper on the micro Doppler shift. Uh, so somebody tried to, I think, tried to apply this to COVID. But this was what, they published this paper and it works. They use the Wi-Fi signal and they get the micro Doppler from the heart. And they pick these reflections up with an antenna. So all you need is an antenna. And then you analyze the micro Doppler shift to look at the heartbeat and work out the emotions. So to find out if someone is nervous, if someone is anxious, you could have this in a hostage situation, a terrorist situation. Uh, it never really worked for COVID. It was a bit fanciful. Uh, this was done by uh, ETH, EPFL, Zurich, uh, was to analyze the cough and look at the spectrum of your cough I look both in the frequency domain and time domain, and then tell you whether you have COVID and you should see a doctor. Another way was to use thermal cameras and then work out if you have a fever 
and then track and trace with traditional cameras. And to track and trace you by using uh, image processing to identify your face. Once they identify your face and your name, go to your social media and track you after you've left the restaurant. So this was an automatic way of track and trace. Uh, however, there are there are security issues here about having access to personal data when you don't want people to know that. But again, that was developed during the COVID pandemic. This one here came out on the 11th of May 2020, and this was, of course, a famous Boston Dynamics dog. I think this was more to do with advertising for the robot dog rather than anything practical. This dog was going around in the Singapore park telling people to social distance. I think this was just corporate advertising rather than anything practical. OK, we're coming to the end, conspiracy theories. So <laughs> I don't know what it's been like in Mexico, but in the UK, we've had lots of conspiracy theories. And we might laugh at them, but unfortunately, they cause problems. This guy is a leading UK conspiracy theorist. He actually has a first class degree in physics from Imperial College, but he's become a madman. He's a climate change denier. He believes Trump really won the election. He believes Bill Gates created the SARS-CoV-2 virus. He believes he's trying to inject us with microchips. He believes 5G destroys DNA, and the pandemic is a plot for world depopulation. Problem is 1% can be true, and that makes it a little learning is a dangerous thing. Uh, just recently, this result came out that there was a possibility of fitting a chip on the tip of a needle. But hold on, you can't inject it in, you can't control anybody, you can't do anything with it. So, but people latch on to the 1%. The lies have consequences. So 5G spreads COVID-19. We've had 77 cellular masks have been attacked in the UK by the 6th of May, 2020. And these idiots were also attacking 5G Wi-Fi. So 5G Wi-Fi, of course, is not the same as 5G cellular. 5G Wi-Fi just refers to five gigahertz. But uh, you know, I don't know how many have been attacked now, and some uh, technicians and engineers have also been threatened with violence. The thing is, if you keep repeating a lie often enough, people believe it, and this is what they do. They just keep repeating the lie over and over again. So how do we lie with statistics? Look at this. Take a true statistic and promote a false conclusion. Here's Joe's cath. One out of every 10,000 customers gets sick. That's a sickness rate of 0.01%. That's very good. Look at Meg's cath. Four out of every 10,000 gets sick. That's just 0.04%. Very, very good. The headline could be, don't eat at Meg's. Meg's cafe sickness is 400% that of Joe's because it's four times. Or Meg would have to close. Or you could have two great cafes. Meg's sickness rate is just 0.03% more than Joe's, and people would go to Meg's. It's how you present the information. So back to Pierce Corbin. <coughs> he produced this result. He said 60% of COVID deaths are double vaccinated. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, this looks dangerous. How can that be? And uh, I, was a, I was a fool, really. My son, who's a doctor, told me off for it. And then I thought about it, and of course, it's completely wrong. He said, you have more chance of dying after being double vaccinated compared to being unvaccinated. And most people believe this because this is actually true. This is roughly true. So we checked this and we find it's about 44% were double vaccinated. Now, he said that this is a conspiracy to kill people. So why, why are 40% double vaccinated? Does that mean that vaccines don't work? So think about a similar situation. Think about seat belts. Seat belts have an efficacy. They don't give you 100% protection. Some people in seat belts will die. So we had this many vehicles occupants killed in, in the USA. 90% wore seat belts out of 220 million, 22 million drivers. So 200 million wore seat belts. 22 million did not wear seat belts. Of the people who wore seat belts, 11,000 died. And of the people who didn't, 10,000 died. So look here, you have almost this, you have more, a greater percentage dying of people who wore seat belts, like a greater, the same percentage dying who were vaccinated. And the reason for that is because you have a large number with a small risk, and you have a smaller number with a greater risk. And so that statistic is absolutely correct. That statistic is absolutely correct, that one there. But it gives you the wrong conclusion. And that's what these people are doing. So 
you could have a headline like that, seatbelts don't work or seatbelts do work, whichever way you want to do it. But you're lying with statistics. You're taking a true statistic and lying with it. What if we had 100% wearing seatbelts, that is 100% vaccinated? Then you would say an amazing 100% of vaccinated people, amazing 100% of those who died were vaccinated. Or you could say that vaccinated reduces to a minimum the number of deaths. But some people will never believe that and uh, will just keep putting the fingers in their ears. But just keep repeating it over and over again. And you know what? Thousands of people in the UK believe it. So Mr. Corbyn's response to this, when the BBC pointed this out, he said, shut down the BBC fake news. Don't forget, he's got a first class degree from Imperial College in London. So to summarize, they don't show a conspiracy and vaccines do actually work. Now, I'll leave this, I'll, I'll finish, I'll put this in the maths. You can use Bayes' theorem to actually explain to him. The problem is if you try to put too much maths, you lose the general public. But this explains what he was doing. So I've gone through the maths here just to show what he's doing and why he was actually wrong to draw that conclusion. I'll put that in the PDFs. Now, let me finish with number nine. Science just informs and politicians decide. I discovered when doing this, uh, I gave this at another conference, and somebody asked me, what, how do we need to advance science to defeat COVID? The problem is not science after 18 months. The problem is politicians. And the problem is poverty. And the problem is ignorance. Look how R0 changed in the early days in the United Kingdom. So we knew what was happening in China, but we did nothing because of this guy. And look at this. We had an R0 way above uh, one. Nothing was happening because we hadn't done anything. That was a political decision. Hong Kong, in the 6th of April 221, had only 205 deaths. In fact, now it's only got about 250 deaths. And the reason they have so many deaths was that they had no lockdown. A very highly dense place. They had border closures, test and track isolate. They knew about SARS and they implemented all the right political decisions right away. They used tracker apps and wristbands. So take two cities. Take New York City and Hong Kong, almost the same. 6th of April 2021, 31,000 deaths in, in New York, 205 deaths in Hong Kong. Both knew the science, but politically, one was prepared to take the, to actually do something about it. Take three countries, take the USA, 328 million, five, half, half, half a, what's that, half a million deaths. UK, 127, that's pro rata. Look at Vietnam. 97.5 million. How many deaths? Well, probably about 150,000, maybe. No, they had 35 deaths because they took different political decisions. And it's a tale of leadership. Look what this guy said. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle. It will disappear. This was before it even started. And then I see the disinfectant. Is there a way we can do something like that by injection? Insider, almost a cleaning? This is at the start of the pandemic. The pandemic is fading away. It's going to fade away. How could America not have all these deaths? It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what you do. It's politics. 555,000 deaths. Bolsonaro in Brazil continually criticized social distancing, wearing masks, not shaking hands, and mock those who did. 341,000 deaths. Our Prime Minister, I was at a hospital the other night where I think there were a few coronavirus patients, and I shook hands with everybody. You'll be pleased to know, and I continue to shake hands. He's showing how macho he is, what machismo. He's not afraid. Then he said on the 19th of March, this is just before our lockdown, the next 12 weeks could turn the tide of this disease and send coronavirus packing in our country. What rubbish. And then on the 17th of July, there'll be a turn to virtual normality by November 2020, hopefully in time for Christmas. And what happened? We had a third lockdown for three months on the 6th of January 2021, and we had 127,000 deaths. So and after 18 months, we have the science to defeat COVID, but we also need to hold to account the anti-science, COVID-skeptical populist leaders who acted late and prioritized their careers 
over the safety of their own electorate. This man, this man, this man, Modi from India, Putin from Russia. Now, this is a Mexican conference. I'm not going to put in anything about Mexico. I'll let you do that yourself if you want to. That would be uh, offensive for me to say that here. So thank you very much for listening. I'm going to finish with just 30 seconds of some music, and then I'll unshare my screen, or I'll leave it on. Oh, okay. okay oh. Thank, That's it. Thank you very much for your presentation. This, uh, now, now, sorry. Now let's let's see if uh, someone has got a question for you. I I do, but I I would like he, uh, to hear some other questions first if someone has. For questions, you can raise your hand. Is that Ericsson? Hi, Ericsson, is that you? Come on, don't be shy. Mark Aurelio, go. Okay. So hi. we have questions on the chat, Aldo. Yeah, hi. Okay, uh, go. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Des. This is Marco Cárdenas. Uh, thank you. I, I listened to this presentation. It was very nice. Um, uh, I was thinking about all of these things that uh, you presented. It's very interesting because it is actually the research area, you know, using the tools that I know. And uh, well, uh, maybe I have lost a bit of time you know, not uh, looking too much to the coronavirus and try to do something else. So thank you. Thank you about this presentation. And uh, well, I love a lot uh, at the end of the presentation when you considered not to say anything about Mexico's president. <laughs> so that's very political from you. Thank yes. you. It was really nice uh, to see you and to listen to you. And uh, very well, nice. Maybe, uh, Marco. Maybe you better not say anything about uh, Mexico's president. Since, yeah. <laughs> uh, Aldo, Aldo could lose his funding at Sinvestar. You know. <laughs> yeah. For the Thank record, for the, for the record, if uh, this is being recorded, I'd like oh. to say I, I, have, I have full confidence in I didn't see all anything. the presidents of Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you and uh, see you. Bye bye. Yes. I, I see something in the chat that says the PDFs. I'm going to send the PDFs to Aldo and Giselle, and they can they can give them to all the uh, the people who are here. I'm sorry it was very rushed, but uh, you have the PDFs and you can read them all yourself. Okay, there is another question. This let's see, uh, Carlos, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Doctor Des. Hi, right, Carlos. Um, my question is, even when science is so clear about how to overcome the COVID, the, the COVID virus, how is it possible that um, even though we have the technology or the knowledge, <coughs> how does the political leaders does not take action with the information we have? <laughs> OK, OK, because it, it's different in different countries. So, for example, um, Bolsonaro has got a lot of support amongst ranchers and farmers, the people cutting down the Amazon, you know, big business. And when you when you have a lockdown, you economically harm the country. That is true. So a lot of business people were happy not to have a lockdown, you know, because uh, they wanted to stay open, they wanted to keep working, and um, they didn't want to lose all their stuff. Uh, secondly. Uh, if you come from the right wing, libertarian, you don't believe in the state interfering. So a, a libertarian position uh, is one where you have a small state, uh, small taxes, uh, low spend. And the idea that the state could come in and tell people 
to actually stay at home and pay people to stay at home. This is this goes against everything they politically believe in. So in our country, Johnson, in order to keep himself in power, had to appease these people and knew that he would uh, he would lose his job. And then, of course, uh, you have people like Trump, who who just appeared completely mad. You know, he he wanted to blame China because that was politically uh, helped him. So, uh, and also the Americans have uh, they believe in individual freedom. They believe that uh, you don't have the federal government telling you what to do. So you have incredible statistics now. If you look at Trump supporters and the percentage of them who've been vaccinated. It's incredibly low because of this. So every country has different reasons. In in, in India, uh, Modi, who's a right-wing Hindu nationalist, he uh, allowed to go ahead these big religious rallies with millions of millions of people. These are the biggest rallies ever in the world <laughs> where people go down, people go down and mix together at these Hindu festivals. And this gave a huge spreading event. So the politicians have different reasons in different countries. Okay, thank you. And about how do they present the information? How um, <coughs> this is the decision, uh, the decision is made by the politicians or it's a decision from the scientists who decide to, to provide this information? Right, so I, I, can, I can tell you what happens in the, uh, in the uh, UK. There's a, a scientific committee which is set up to deal with emergencies, and they have biologists, medical doctors, mathematicians, engineers sitting in that. And they meet, and they advise the uh, politicians. So they do modelling, and they tell them what will happen. Here's what will happen if you lock down in one week. Here's what will happen if you lock down in two weeks. Here's what will happen if you lock down in three Here's the number of deaths. Here's the number of hospitalizations. And they give them all that information. And then the politicians make a decision. They have to balance, on one hand, the threat of serious illness against the threat to the economy. So in theory, that's what they're doing. But a lot of it uh, is, uh, I believe, in our case, we acted much too late at the beginning because the, the political instincts of uh, our prime minister were against the state intervening in anything. For the conservative uh, government in the UK, they just do not believe in the state getting involved in people's lives to that extent. So uh, that was the reason. The scientists advise and the politicians decide. But the politicians used the science as an excuse. So they would say, we are just following the science. But of course, we haven't been told what the true science was because a lot of that is kept secret. So I think we'll find out later when there's an inquiry. There's going to be a government inquiry into how the government uh, handled this, but that will not report back for maybe another couple of years. There's a question from Ericsson here. Uh, says, my only question is, if you have been able to match or discover the parameterization of your model for different realities in different countries, or local factors, as you said, would greatly influence the spreading factors, the accuracy of testing. No, that would be very interesting. Yeah, that would definitely be very interesting. But I mean, you know, I was doing this in the evenings along with other work, so I haven't got the time to do that. But that would be a that would be a good joint project between an engineer, an epidemiologist, and maybe a sociologist. So see if you can get government funding for that. Okay, very nice. We have we have another question from Ulrich. Go ahead, please. You. Hello. Go ahead. The last question, and, I, and then I close. Thank you for inviting us. My name is Walter. Please go ahead. Ah, ¿qué hay de las vacunas para menores de 12 años? He's, te, he's telling that, uh, what happened about the vaccination for young people, for people who have less than 12 years old. This. Oh, well, that's a very, very <coughs> important question. Thank you for asking that question, Ulrich. <coughs> that question is, uh, so I've got a cough. 
Sounds like I've got COVID. This is a very controversial thing now. So these um, these conspiracy theorists, they've gone away. They've moved away from their big, mad conspiracies that Bill Gates is trying to vaccinate us and control us with microchips. And they've moved now into this vaccination of young children. And they've led a massive campaign against this. They've said... Um, that this is going to kill young kids, and they've created a lot of fear. They've standed outside schools, and they've uh, they've warned about vaccinating young kids. Now, I'm not a doctor, so I can't comment on this. I have to listen to what the scientists say. The, since the since the children have gone back to school, there's been a lot of spread amongst young children. The children don't actually get ill, but they do spread it. So um, I would be happy if I had young children to have them vaccinated. But the stuff that people are putting online is uh, is really quite frightening. I think, to be honest with this, now not to frighten anybody, what actually happens is that if you take if you take uh, if you vaccinate in our case, I don't know, 50 million people, within those 50 million people, you will get some people who have an adverse reaction to the virus, and they will get ill. That's what happens. People have adverse reactions to peanuts. But we don't stop eating peanuts. People have adverse reaction to paracetamol, ibuprofen. But what the what the what the uh, coronavirus conspiracy theorists do, they focus on these one or two people who do get ill. And I have to say, I have a friend of mine who is seriously, seriously ill after the vaccine. But that's a very, very unfortunate and very, very uh, un unusual case. Um, and you have to take it in the whole. How many people have been vaccinated? How many people have been saved from getting seriously ill? And yes, there will be some people. So I think if you're a young person and your government advises you to take the vaccine, I would certainly give it to my children, although they've grown up now. They don't need it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Wes. I, I used to have one last question, and yes. it's about the super spreaders. I mean, I, yes. I saw the maths. I, under, I understand more or less everything you said, but uh, in plain words, are super spreaders a bad news or not? I mean, well, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, I, was, I was hoping nobody would ask me that question because super spreaders, uh, in fact, the, the guy who, who started the whole thing in the UK was a super spreader. He was at a skiing resort in uh, Switzerland and he had a big party in you know, March, whatever it was. And then he came flying back to the UK and he spread it to everybody. Uh, so if you have super spreaders, but with a very, very low dispersion number, it means you'll have a few massive super spreaders. But because uh, you have lots of the R numbers go from being very large, some very large down to some a whole lot, almost zero, then there comes a tipping point, I believe whereby the super spreaders cause a problem, but because you have so many people who are zero, they mean that the, var the, 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 the pathogen cannot promote. Now, I don't know the maths of this too well. I'm, I'm only an engineer. So the, the problem with very low dispersion K numbers, if the number is very, very low, then the disease can end because it's nowhere to go. Because although you get big super spreaders, you also get lots of zeros. The problem is when you have the K number that's not so low that you've got lots of zeros, you've got some zeros, but you still got a lot of big super spreaders and it can still spread. And those, yeah. those, those values of the K numbers allow you to, uh, to try to identify where these super spreaders are. Because if you can identify these super spreader events and cut them out, then you can reduce the spread. Okay, I mean, my question was because uh, at, the, at this present moment, I mean, many people is vaccinated, but some of, so, some of us have not yet the, the vaccine. And worse, there are, because of the conspiracy theories, most of people are super spreaders this. Then what is the chance and the final probability of ending this? That's, the, that's the, my final question. That, that was the point of the previous one. <laughs> Well, the probability of ending it, it's never going to end. It's going to be endemic. But the question is, are you going to stop it overwhelming the health service? And um, it won't end until everybody in the world has been vaccinated 
and then it'll become like influenza. Every year we get a different uh, uh, virus for influenza. Uh, we sequence the virus and we vaccinate people and people live with it and people do die. But I noticed that some places are now talking about another lockdown. I think it was, I heard on the news, it was, was it Austria? Not a lockdown, but in, in, in bringing in restrictions again. Because all this stuff that I presented, this assumes that the vaccine is, uh, is you know, lasts forever. The vaccine doesn't last forever. It disappears or wanes after six months. I'm waiting to get my third booster jab now. So, okay. Uh, okay. yeah. Okay. okay. And Gerardo, please, uh, we are finished. Can you conclude? Yeah, we have to stop like, because uh, we'll continue with the uh, final technical sessions. Professor okay. Desmond Lernon, uh, it was a really a pleasure to 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 have this uh, what a most realistic topic to to talk about with some science statistics and and experiences in many countries. Uh, we we know that this is a very complex uh, problem for human being and and we still we are still suffering of that. So. Um, uh, so it was a pleasure uh, for the conference. So on behalf of the program committee of the CCE 2021, we want to to acknowledge your participations, uh, to to share your your uh, thoughts, uh, experiences, uh, and and we we really thank you for your participation. So thank you very much uh, for your. Uh, interesting topic and we will read uh, in more detail your your slides because uh, there are uh, a lot of information on that so thank you very much thank you very much it's been a pleasure thank you okay thank you so <laughs> okay oh, <great> <laughs> Okay. Bye then. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. I go. So we expect to see you soon, soon here in Mexico City. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. Can I? Shall I leave now? Yes. Oh. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.